So tragedy helps bring us love and creativity. It's an impetus for that. It can be very hard. It can be very painful. But I view everything through the prism of love and creativity, and that includes tragedy. And if you understand that the life, the universe itself is not perfect, then we are not perfect, and then life is not perfect. And you, and if you get there, then you start to see the wonder and the awe. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you're here to meet the author of today's book. Welcome to Digital Book Nooks, Meet the Author Show, where you can discover your next great book with your host, D.G. Thomas. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to today's Meet the Author show. What is the meaning of life? It's a question that most of us at some point in time begin to ask ourselves. Where well, today's author has written, a, has written a book about this topic, and we will be discussing it today. So I'm excited to introduce you to today's guest author, Dave Dale, who is here to discuss his book, The Purpose of Life, to Create, to Love, and to Create. Dave Dale was born the son of a minister in Dawson's Creek, British Columbia. He was exposed to religion, religion, hockey, and cold weather at an early age. Dale attended University of British Columbia and received a business degree. His work experience includes being an airport manager, business consultant, founder of a tech company, member of the board of governors of a university, and a policy advisor to cabinet to government cabinet members for science, technology, and transportation. Those experiences included both successes and failures and provided him with insight into how many elements in our society do work or do not work, including business, education, religion, government, transportation, technology, and marketing. Grateful for his life and some of the hard lessons he has learned that have made him a better person, and those lessons were a catalyst for his desire to help people. Dave presently lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, and is a self-described health nut who intermittently fasts daily, like stand-up comedy, and is a skeptical optimist that values the micro moments of connections with others. Hi, Dave. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you How for are, having me. Thank you for being here. And I apologize, my cell phone. I thought I turned it off. <laughs> And it's still on. I'm turning it back off now. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it stays off this time. So um, today's topic, your book, is about uh, the purpose of life. And people have always searched for the, the purpose of life. I think at some point in time, maybe as you get older, and a lot of people in our younger generation today want to know what's the purpose, what's the meaning. And so I want to first ask you, why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write this book. Uh, I was just actually read a quote by uh, Toni Morrison, actually. And she says, if, if there's a book out there that you think that needs to be written, you better write it yourself. Um, I've always been the son of a minister. I grew up with religion. I used to pepper my dad with these questions about why are we here? And I was never satisfied with any answer. I, I, I'm a, I've always looked at it. I've always read about it i've always thought about it and i was never happy with any of the answers i heard and i finally you know i i I quote einstein in my book talking about i'm not einstein said i'm not necessarily the smartest guy but i'm the person that stays with the problem the longest and that's what i kind of feel about this issue because i just always thought about it and it uh was something that i wanted to resolve and and writing gives you a mode to think about it in a different way and so I launched forth on it, and I was actually really amazed at what I discovered and what I found. So speaking of what you, what you found, tell us about your latest release. Um, the book is self-evident in the title, um, but 
I, the more I dig into it, the more I find out about love and creativity and the nuances and the aspects to it, I think are underappreciated. The more I see, the more clear, the more resolute I became that this was really an answer for today. I mean, as I say in the forward, I'm not really sure where evolution is going to take human beings because we use such a small portion of our brains. And I think as a, you know, culture was still very spiritually muted, but for today, for now, you know, for the problems we all face, we need to apply creativity and love to all those problems. And the more you learn about love and the more you see it as more than just, for instance, love more than just an emotion as a real energy, um, it really can f- capture you and forward you and, 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 and help you live a fulfilling life. I mean, I, I used to wake up in the middle of the night. I think like a lot of people do wondering, okay, why am I here? You know, how, what am I going to do before I die? Well, all these kind of different things. And after going through this process and it's, and, and it's really a voyage of self-discovery for me as well and discovery of the universe was that I found that I'm more complacent, not complacent, but more calm. And I, I feel more fulfilled and I'm, you know, it doesn't absolutely does not solve all my problems, but it certainly gives me a, a way to view problems and and to address problems through creativity and love, but also to see that this is a way to fulfillment. And fulfillment is more important than happiness, which can go sort of up and down and rotates, you know, because tragedy is always part of everyone's lives. And I devote a chapter onto this, but it's also something that um, is also going to impact your happiness. So I, I, I really found that it was, the more I dug into it, the more I, you know, I use a lot of quotes in the book because to add texture, to add backup and confirmation and, and to, for my ratify my arguments, but also to give the reader a sense of the journey that I went through on this too. Mm-hmm. Because it really, some of these things really open your eyes and, you know, that's what I hope people see. And that's what I hope they come to recognize because it's, to me, it, it really began to fit more and more like a really good, you know, glove, uh, the, you know, my sort of initial thoughts, my initial expectations. And I was just in some ways blown away by how everything sort of came together to make sense. So um, you talk about the research that you did, how you really dug into coming up with um, this concept. So where did you get the idea that the purpose of life is to love and to create um, well, m- my starting point was, you know, I looked at, you know, f- philosophers like Albert Camus and Schopenhauer, who basically said, you know, and some physicists like Steve Weinberg basically said, life is pointless, life is absurd. And I, and I just look around me and I, I see the wonder, I see the awe, I see the beauty. And I go, I don't accept, I fundamentally don't accept that life is a pointless, you know, trotting through suffering and that it's has no meaning and it's just not a, there's no value to it. And it's just, you just, it's a pointless existence. I just didn't accept that. And I said, okay, well, well, where do you look for that? And I look to see what the universe does. And I look every day, the universe creates. Every day the universe loves. I mean, you know, there's a newborn baby. I mean, so I put a baby on the cover of my book mm-hmm. because there's nothing like the wonder of a newborn baby with the, you know, the sense of awe, the innocence, the natural love. I mean, I quote in my book, um, I, saw, I saw on a television program um, where a newborn father said, when I saw the birth of my daughter, I saw love. And to me, that was always very powerful. And it mm-hmm. said, yeah, that's true you have this baby entering the world and it's just love. And so I started with that and I looked at what the universe did. And I said, then I asked the next question. It goes, what makes the universe, you know, so, so wonder and awe, what, what's, what is that? And it's because the universe is constantly creating and constantly loving. And the more I dug into it, you know, I, 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 I taught, I looked at uh, these philosophers again, like I said, Camus and Schopenhauer, 
And if you dig in deep to what they said later on, what they when they talk about love, when they talk about art, when they talk about creativity, they say it's the most important thing. Yeah. And they say that they basically say love gives you meaning to your life, but you know, love is pointless and absurd because I think they suffered. I mean, they had terribly hard lives mm -hmm. and tragedy just everywhere they turned. And I think those tragedies blinded them to the wonder and the awe that is creativity and love and what life can be. And, and that's, and that's why I, I went and looked hard at tragedy in the book. I mean, I knew it was going to be a hard chapter. I didn't really know how I was going to uh, address it. But, you know, I, I came away, one of the things I came away with was Stephen Hawking said, life is not perfect. If mm -hmm. life was perfect, we would not exist as human beings. You know, if life was perfect, the universe would be in this gigantic set of stabilization of perfection and that there basically be, be stagnation. And that's not what the universe is. So tragedy helps bring us love and creati creativity. It's an impetus for that. It can be very hard. It can be very painful. But I view everything through the prism of love and creativity, and that includes tragedy. And if you understand that the life, the universe itself is not perfect, then we are not perfect, and then life is not perfect. And you, and if you get there, then you start to see the wonder and the awe. So many people have really proposed different ideas about what the purpose of life is. So some may say that the purpose of life is to learn lessons or to have experiences. And um, so was there a defining moment or um, something specific that confirms for you um, this proposition that you make that love and creation is the purpose you know i talk about in the book well where i say that love is not an emotion mm -hmm. love is more an energy mm -hmm. and i reflect back on on my life and watching my father dying of cancer and they basically gave him one month i'm sorry one week to live i was there at the hospital and the doctor said i'm sorry you know you have, you know, you have a very severe form of cancer. It's spread to your whole body and you've got basically got a week to live. And my, my father basically turned to, to me and my brother and looked us in the eye and says, take care of your mother. And, you know, he was, as I said, he was a minister. We lived in a rectory, so we didn't have our house of our own. And... <laughs> not only are we facing our father dying or my wife's, my mother's case, her husband dying, okay. but we're going to be homeless. Wow. And, and my father, given that sentence of one week, even though his cancer was gripping his body, even though I had intense pain, hmm. he um, survived for six months. Wow. And he, managed to find a condominium the, the market did this incredible dip and he took his rather meager savings and, and, and bought a condo and was basically dead you know a week later hmm. so it wasn't so as i say in the book it wasn't i can't say there was an emotion the love was an emotion that kept him fighting to do that I mean, he had to tap into an energy uh, to, to sustain himself and to um, accomplish what he had to accomplish because of his undying love for my mother. And that was everything. So that, to me, that was very, very powerful. But just in almost in day-to-day in -day life, I just see it and I read it and I read great quotes and I've put them in my book, as I've said. And I, I just, it just, it just grows stronger and stronger to me that this is an answer, at least for today, where, again, we are in terms of evolution. Mm -hmm. That's, um, that's very interesting um, about the energy that, and that love produced 
um, that you believe to help, to help your father really be able to be here longer, you know, out of love for his family. Um, speaking of love, in the book, and you mentioned earlier, you speak about um, nuances and aspects of love that you feel like are unappreciated. So what, without giving away too much, it's in the book, if it's something you might want to talk about a little bit. Well, I, I, I sort of alluded to it a little bit because I, I talked about, you know, love not being an emotion. Like, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the dichotomy and the continuum is always love is the opposite of hate and hate is the opposite of love. And my position is that lowers and disvalues, uh, devalues love and it elevates hate. And that really love is on a, is a whole, on a whole different plane. And that's why I, I sort of decry that love is, is, an, is not an emotion. And, and further in our society, you know, we, basically worship and elevate romantic love, mm -hmm. which is fine. You know, that's good. I have nothing against romantic love, but the real love is, love is much more than that. I mean, it transcends all our lives. And we also, as a culture, at the same time we elevate romantic love, we also are a little frivolous in how we describe it. In the sense that you know, we say we like a pair of shoes. We like brownies. We like chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, we love it, <laughs> right? Yeah, we, uh -huh. we say we love it, and it's sure that's great. It's wonderful. You like it, but it's in some ways that, in my mind, devalues and degrades love a little bit. I mean, uh -huh. I quote in the book Buddha saying, "If you if you love a if you like a flower, you pick it and you put it in your vase for a couple mm -hmm. of days. If you love a flower." You water it every day. Yeah. And, right. and, and to me, these distinctions are important and, and very illustrative and illuminating to what we think about love and how it can be. I mean, I spent a lot of book, book talking about love and the nuances mm -hmm. and, also, and, and creativity too, and the, the symbiotic relationship those, those, things, those two have. And I, I, I really feel and I've come to believe um, if you love, it it, it, it it has incredible health benefits to you. It has incredible fulfillment to you. You know, if, if it fills your life with joy, bliss, fulfillment, and and and, and so same with creativity. Mm -hmm. um, I, one of the interesting things there's uh, is I sort of took the work of uh, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, a French philosopher, she talked about love is not the couple facing inward. Love, the evolution of love is the couple, couple, the couple taking that love and then projecting it into the world. And I took a look at that and I came across some work by this biologist by the name of Dr. Barbara Erickson. I think she's from the University of North Carolina. And she talks and she wrote a book called Love.20 and she talks about micro moments of connection mm -hmm. in your day-to-day -day life. And she went and started looking at the biological effects, you know, your immune system, your heart, your vagus nerve. When you have these connections, they all strengthen, they all become stronger. And, you know, it's, it's her, her research is extraordinarily interesting. And I, I just thought it was a nice juxtaposition to take what the work of Wavoir had done with what she had done in terms of, you know, an external look towards love as opposed to just, you know, the, the couple facing themselves and love and it's just sort of more of a external uh, orientation. And I went through and I looked and I started founding all these quotes of, of really the key to life is various versions of love thy neighbor. And to me, that was very profound. I mean, it's in some ways, it's, you know, we've heard it. We've always, obviously grown up in a Judeo-Christian society. And we talk about the Ten Commandments a lot. But when you see it molded and shaped and referred to in different ways, mm -hmm. it, it sort of hits home a little bit more. And then you combine it with the science of, say, Barbara Erickson with the philosophy of Simone de Beauvoir. It, 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 I think it comes together quite 
interestingly and nicely. Right. So we've talked a lot about love. How does the how does creation come into into the purpose? Creativity, as I was saying, we need we need to create. Mm -hmm. uh, we suffer if we don't create, um, and we fulfilled if we create. One of the ask one of the things that sort of again ratified what my view of of why love and creativity creativity are at least building blocks for meaning and the purpose of life is looking at things like is the uniqueness of our perspective. We as individuals, ourselves, I, of all through human, of all history, not just human history, of all history, we have a unique perspective, totally unique from any, anyone else. And because of that neat, unique perspective, we offer something valuable to the, to the universe. We can love and we can create from an absolutely unique perspective. And really the universe grows and evolves through our creations and our three loves as little aspects of the universe. I'm going to talk about in the book about a hologram. To me, a hologram is always interesting. It's, it's a very interesting phenomena where the overall image is the same as a small image that is a component part of the, of the hologram. So I look at uh, we as individuals and the universe as holograms, but not in the sense that the love and creativity are the aspects that drive our, the universe and also drive us. So we, <clears throat> small elements of the universe, are love and creation in a hologram form, just a small version of the universe creating and loving. And it's, it's like I said, one of my subtitle in my book is meaning in life is found by expressing expressing love through creativity. <clears throat> That's what you do. You take and channel love uh, to create. And, and creation takes on life of its own. What I start with or what someone else starts in creation is picked up and run run by somebody else. So it it I think the two things are really, you know, when we talk about things like the time space continuum and you know death and whatever, things that continue on no matter what are love and creation. And um, they, they just it's the more you get into it, the more you explore creation, the more amazing it is. Right. I bet it is. And I, I know a lot of people may feel like they are not creative people, but yes. I feel like we all have the ability to be able to create and we all bring something most definitely. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, it's the skill it's, it's the creative journey is an interesting one. I mean, as you know, Picasso says, I start to, I start to paint and I don't know, have any idea where I'm going. Mm -hmm. I have one thought in mind, and I quickly supersede it, and I move on. And and one of the things, you know, is is just I, I was looking at some. This, this guy did some research on your odds of being born, and it's like one in quadrillion something. Mm -hmm. And and then you look, and then you recognize what these Carl Sagan says. Look, you are a large part of your body is from stardust, you know, the calcium mm -hmm. and all these different elements. So everyone is really special and everyone has a story to tell. And if they don't tell the story, it hurts you. It negates you. It causes illness, you know, it ferments evil, all those kind of things. It's, they're just such a necessary component to live is to love and to create. I mean, it's essential. Mm -hmm. So I only have one last question for you today. Um, what do you hope readers get from this book? I hope uh, readers have a get a, a even a, a new appreciation for love and creativity, and just look at it maybe in a subtle, new way, and look at look at applying love and creativity to their lives mm 
uh, but also to their problems, but also to the problems of the world. Because my point is that love and creativity are energies. You know, the law of thermodynamics is energy is never destroyed. So it's just a matter of redirecting uh, that energy to the problems we face. And I'm, you know, the last thing I would say is I've always been captured and just absolutely, in, 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 you know, uh, captivated by the, you know, chaos theory mm. and the, the, the idea of a butterfly flapping its wings and cause a, a, a hurricane somewhere in the world. Well, I, I tend to look at it the, the flip side as well is that just even a little bit of action by any of us can have this massive effect well beyond we can anything we can ever envision so that there really is incredible positive outcomes from taking little subtle steps of kindness creation and love all right well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. This has been a very interesting discussion, and I think that our listeners will really gain a lot from this conversation, discussion, and the book. Speaking of the book, I want to show it. It is The Purpose of Life, to Love and to Create. The Meaning of Life is Found, Expressing Love Through Creativity by Dave Dale. And it is available at Amazon.com. So thank you, everyone, for watching the show today. Please make sure you stop by the Digital Book Nook blog to read the rest of Dave's interview. And also check out his book on Amazon.com and get a copy today. Thanks again for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.